Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and the third part of our Channel Islands at War Week. And I have to say, I've been really impressed with the feedback so far. The two shows uh, that we did yesterday and the day before were really well received. For those who thought they knew about the subject, they learned something. And quite a few people didn't know anything about the subject at all and found it all very enlightening. So that's fantastic. So if you are a new viewer and we've had a new few new people come in over the last few days, thank you very much for, for giving us your attention. And don't forget to think about becoming a subscriber by clicking that little notifications button and also maybe consider becoming a patron and or a YouTube channel member. And as always, all the information is in the channel uh, description below. So my guest today, it's always good when I bring in someone who I actually know because uh, I started this using friends who I'd met in real life. And then there was a whole phase of meeting people virtually. And then since the since COVID has not quite gone away, but mostly gone away, we've now been able to meet up at places. So I met today's guest, Nick, at the We Have Ways Fest. So this is an overlap show because no, Nick is one of the independent company uh, members who follow James Holland and Al Murray. And we met in July in England. And now he's coming on to talk about um, the commando raids in the Channel Islands. And Nick is over in Guernsey. So I'm going to bring Nick in now. And before I just bring him in on screen, the link to his incredible blog, which is updated regularly, Island Fortress, is in the description below. And I really urge you, if you want to keep up to date with what's going on in the Channel Islands, to just sort of start bookmarking that brilliant blog and resource and learning more about the subjects we're tackling today. But I'm going to bring Nick in now. So um, good evening, Nick. How are you today? I'm good, thank you, Woody. And thank you very much for inviting me on to speak. Well, it's, it's the pleasure is all mine. So, I mean, we talked yesterday and the day before. We did the Atlantic Wall. We did how extensive that is there and the, the, the depth of defence is there. And that brought up the subject that the Allies, in the end, never decided to invade the island fully. Then with Duncan yesterday, we, we did the, the, the situation of the occupy, occupation and what the civilians there were dealing with. But now we're going to look with you at the fact that the Allies did plan various things some some happened some didn't happen and you're going to take us through this this series of of we're going to call, we're calling them commando raids but some of them are kind of reconnaissance some of them are bigger some of them are smaller some of them involve agents but you're going to take them through us uh, through it but just for people who are watching tell us a little bit about your background you know you're you're firmly a channel channel islander so tell us a little about yourself and how you were interested in the in the history of the of the area sure um well, if anybody that's been to the Channel Islands will know, you can't really go anywhere without being near a bit of our history. Um, mostly massive bunkers and other fortifications and things like that, as well as Napoleonic um, things as well. Um, and I started looking into uh, various aspects of, of the occupation, mostly because a lot of the key works that are around that um, were written you know, quite some time ago now. Um, you know, particularly some some uh, you know really key books that were written back in the mid seventies, when doing a bit of research wasn't so easy. A lot of stuff was still restricted in the mm. archives, so you couldn't get at it. And I started looking at that just out of my for my own interest. And then I started talking to a few people, and they they said, you know, why don't you share this information? Why don't you write a book? And I said, no, I haven't got time for that. And then it was suggested maybe I should do a blog. Um, so I started it thinking not very many people are going to be particularly interested in this. And it's kind of taken off a little bit, really. Well, it has. And, and the fact is, you know, it's providing this information about an aspect that, as we discussed with Duncan and Philip, it overlaps so many areas. I mean, people from watching this from the UK proper will identify with some of the aspects of, you know, like we talked with Duncan, the rationing, the occupation, or well, not the occupation, the rationing, the hardships. Then other people who are interested in commando raids will be watching it because of that. Then there's the kind of concrete heads who love bunkers. It's got that as well. So the channel lines kind of really do have a bit of everything. And of course, there's the Holocaust aspect that, that we'll be covering with, with, with Dr. Jilly Carr on Monday. That is another subject we can go into greater detail later on because the Alderney subject is, 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 is thoroughly in the news right now. So the channel lines kind of becoming really um, a focal point because there's so much the World War II student can get out of studying that area because it as i say it overlaps so many areas but i'm gonna hand it over to you and you've come over with a, an incredible powerpoint presentation and folks far away with your questions as we go along tonight because as we go through the various raids that do do and don't happen it, it'll be best to address the questions as they come up and uh basically over to you nick brilliant thanks willie so i thought i'd start off um with a little map there from good old google maps just to give you a bit of a feel for where the islands uh sit uh you can see Guernsey, obviously, 
there, um, and Jersey down the bottom. And then at the top where it says St. Anne, that's actually Alderney, which you can see how close that is to the Cherbourg Peninsula. Um, so that just gives you a little flavour of, of where we are, um, just to clarify that. I think you've had a few questions from people, Woody, over the last few days. Well, I, I, I didn't know, but there are there are a string of Channel Islands off the coast of California. And I didn't know that because the only ones I know about, the ones I can physically see when I go to the western coast. But a couple of people were a bit confused about where we were talking about. So thanks for reminding us we are talking about the, the eastern coast of Normandy. Uh, and then some considerable distance to the south, well, not that considerable distance, but a couple hundred miles south of, of, of the mainland of, of UK. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the map. No, anyway, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the commando raids that happened, as Woody alluded to, some of them, um, were, although they were called commando raids, they were a little bit more sort of reconnaissance, and we can, we'll see about the problems that some of that caused to those taking part and to some of the local population as well. Um, and also there was a little bit of an obsession with certain aspects um, from those uh, right up to Churchill um, throughout throughout the war, in fact. Um, and Churchill does get a bit of a doing uh, for letting the islands go in 1940. In fact, if you, um, and, and my latest blog actually caused a bit of, bit of a kerfuffle in a few places um, yesterday, uh, but I think I've addressed those now. <laughs> But uh, he actually had to be really persuaded hard, and Duncan mentioned this, to, to actually go along with demilitarizing the Channel Islands. Mm. He really didn't want to give them up, but was persuaded in the end that it was the only thing to do. And to be fair, it would have caused massive loss of life of civilians um, if, if they'd done anything else. So we'll look a little bit about you know uh, what they tried to do, thinking about trying to take back one or all of the islands as well. Um, so... Most people, if they have heard about commando raids on the Channel Islands, they just think, oh, Operation Basalt, because that was the one that's had the most publicity um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm not really going to go into those now because I know you've got the excellent Eric Lee coming on on Monday live from Sark, where I will yep. be um, as well. I'm looking forward to meeting up with Eric and a few others. Um, but the reality was raids started just after the invasion. Um, incredibly quickly after the uh, invasion. And during the course of the war, Mount Batten uh, particularly and Churchill became a little bit obsessed with uh, raids on the Channel Islands. And there were actually numerous planned or actual raids that happened. Um, so let's kick off with the first raid, Operation Anger. Now, this is quite an interesting raid. Um, Purely because the uh, islands, well, Guernsey was taken on the 30th of June. And by the 8th of uh, July, uh, Hubert Nicol uh, came home. Uh, he actually got briefed on the 4th uh, and was here, dropped off by submarine on the 8th uh, with the aim of finding out. Churchill had specifically given an order that he wanted to find out what was going on um, since the Germans had arrived. Uh, and he arrived, as I say, by submarine. And uh, this picture I took is from the top of the cliffs where he came up, as you can see, on the south coast of Guernsey. Not a very easy place to get up, but of course, being a Guernsey man, he knew the area well. Uh, he came in civilian clothing because the Germans had only literally arrived just over a week before. There was still relatively free movement for him uh, because there weren't actually that many of them here in the island and they were they were concentrated mostly around some peace ports at that time they did have uh, other uh, areas where they had troops but they tended to take them back towards St Peter Port. there were roughly at this time about 450 uh, troops in the island uh, and so he could move around using back lanes etc and of course, because they hadn't been here very long, there were no ID cards or anything like that yet. And he could just pass himself off as a normal local person. He, in fact, went and stayed with his family um, during the course of this. Um, and there's a, actually where I took the photo, there is a stone there to Hubert Nicol, who later won an MC, which I will talk about a little bit later on. That's a memorial at the top of the cliffs. Um, it's um, a 
quite a spectacular view from up there as well. It's well worth going out there, not only to see that, but also to have a look at the view. Uh, but if you do go on the cliff paths for a walk, there are some very steep steps, I'll warn you now. Uh, especially if you've got little legs like me, because I'm I'm a true Gern. <laughs> um, they definitely weren't designed by a Guernsey man, put it that way. <laughs> anyway, um, so Operation Anger then went on to become Operation Ambassador. Um, and frankly, this was a, a bit of a comedy of errors. I mean, the the time that Hubert arrived, he actually arrived from the submarine on a uh, canoe that had been purchased from Gamages, the store in London. They'd been trying to work out how they were going to get him ashore, and uh, somebody got dispatched to Gamages to buy a foldable canoe, which they unfortunately assembled within inside the submarine, and then found they couldn't get it out of the hatch. So they had to take it apart again and put it back together. Um, he, he was successful in doing his reconnaissance, gathered quite a lot of information, including walking around the perimeter of the airport to have a look and see what's going on up there. Um, he then went back to the beach where he had landed. Uh, and on the a night of the 10th of July, uh, two other Guernseymen, uh, Lieutenant Martel and Malal Holland, uh, were landed as well. Um, and they were there to prepare for the next stage, which was Operation Ambassador, which was due to take place on the 13th um, of July. Um, and Ambassador was a much more ambitious uh, operation. It was a true commando raid. Uh, so the force involved in Ambassador was assembled of 140 men. Um, it was led by uh, John Durnford Slater, who had only been ordered uh, to raise and command number three commando about a month before. And they'd really had no special training. Um, they had been pulled together at very, very short notice, as I say. Um, and initially, they were supposed to arrive on the 13th. Unfortunately, uh, Mulholland and Martel went to go and meet them. Uh, and on the 13th, but bad weather had interfered. Uh, and they were, uh, had to go away and come back. Um, they failed, unfortunately, to meet up with them. Uh, I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, I mentioned there on the slide, David Niven was involved in this. Um, he actually was a staff officer, and he uh, briefed uh, the men that were involved in Ambassador. Uh, he alludes to it, actually, in, in his book, The Moons of Balloon, his autobiography, uh, and uh, some of the facts in that seem, I don't know if it was the passage of time from when he wrote it, um, don't tie up with... Yeah, everyone. David Niven did like to, he did like to embellish a bit. His, his autobiographies yeah. were brilliant, weren't they? But you you, tend, you sense that the stories have been, they've been done a few times and that the, the, the numbers have got increased and the pet, the pet, the daring do has got greater, but yeah, great books. But I just want to jump in at this point and just say that, you know, we're now in course post June, 1940, we're after Churchill's, you know, call to arms, this, we must strike yeah. back the, the command that the, the famous commando order that sets everything into motion. So we've, when we've had other people like on like Damien Lewis, this is this urgency now for the Brits to invent special forces. You know, there, there, there was the era where there weren't anything that we would now identify as commandos. And suddenly within months, all these independent forces, a small scale raiding forces, the commandos and, the, and with what later became the SAS all spring out of nowhere on kind of an old, old boys network at the beginning. So it was a rush to kind of get something off the ground, kind of to, to prove to Churchill the the the, the concept had had um, had legs, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And they took volunteers from all different um, sections of the army, um, and we'll see in a minute uh, why that perhaps wasn't such a good idea at some mm. point. Uh, at the end of an ambassador, there was a bit of finger pointing uh, between the various services uh, as to some of the issues that arose during the course of the raid. So they uh, were supported by these two uh, ships that you can see here, um, who towed some boats across, and uh, those were to be used to land uh, the troops. Unfortunately, some of them being towed behind uh, one of these, which was going at a fair old rate of knots, 
it took its toll on them and they were uh, some of them were partially submerged when they got as far as Guernsey uh, some of them were quite badly damaged and and simply not serviceable they also used and thanks to Stephen um, Fisher who, who provided me with this um, from the IWM archive uh, in a lot of the accounts it talks about them using RAF crash boats uh, they in fact used uh, these were RAF seaplane tenders and definitely not really suitable for the job um, and they that was one of the things that they took away from the, the raid that these were really not the sort of thing that you want to use um, to try and cover the noise of all these boats moving around as well, um, they flew an Avro Anson over the uh, area where they were landing to drown out the noise of the engines of the boats um, as they were coming along. The pilot was flying around at about 200 feet, according to Durnford Slater's account. Um, and I would recommend, actually, his book um, is absolutely excellent if you want to read about this and many other things that he was involved in. I concur. Um, so this slide, it might not be too clear for everybody, depending on what side their slides their screen is. Um, but they were actually planning on landing in three different places. And it frankly didn't go very well. Um, so on the right hand side, you'll see the Jerberg Peninsula, where they did actually successfully land um, at a place called Petit Port, um, uh, which is just in that sort of triangular shaped bit at the top of the the slide there on the right hand side. They were also going to land at Legeno, which is on the far left. Uh, and uh, they uh, they were going to try and land elsewhere as well. Uh, this really didn't go to plan, partly because of what I was saying to you about they'd used um, boats that really, really weren't suitable for what they were trying to do. Um, uh, for starters, one boat headed in the wrong direction. Uh, now, there is a lot of speculation at uh, what might have caused this. Uh, uh, it, it was speculated in several accounts that maybe it was caused by the fact the commandos piled all their kit into this boat and that made the compass go awry, uh, or that it was something on the destroyer that had made the compass faulty. So that boat actually ended up, um, and interestingly, we're not really sure which island it ended up at. Wow. Uh, it, it could have been Little Sark, which is what David Niven alludes to in his his book, um, where he in his book says that they went ashore and uh, encountered some islanders who took them down the pub. Um, that doesn't tie up with anybody else's accounts because the the accounts for that boat, uh, everyone that was in has got uh, a report from that says that they they basically got lost and didn't go ashore and managed to find their way back eventually. They almost didn't get picked up by um, the destroyers. Um, but they may have ended up either off of Jetu or Herm as well. That's the other possibilities. But you can imagine in the dark, uh, if your compass isn't working, it's not going to be a great experience. Um, so they, they made it up these steps from Petty Port for the, the successful landing. Um, and they built a roadblock at the end of uh, the headland um, where there was a, a, a narrow point in the road which would then stop anybody from coming to interfere with them. They actually used some granite from a, a garden of a house that was there. If you go up there today, there is still these big lumps of granite actually wow. just back, back in the garden of the house. Um, I've got pictures on my blog. There's a blog post about this which shows you what the site looks like now and a lot more photos. Uh, I mentioned the steps. You can see a few of them there. There are an awful lot of them up from that beach. Unfortunately, you can't access the beach at the moment from the steps uh, because there's been a rock fall, but they are fixing that. Uh, but you can see it's quite a popular spot to go and moor your boat in the top right there. There's a, a few boats there. So they, they actually um, made quite a lot of progress around the headland looking for Germans because what they wanted to do was actually get a couple of Germans and take them back so that they could get some intelligence about what was going on. Uh, Dernfeld Slater, um, at one point, jumps into um, a, a makeshift machine gun pit, expecting to find uh, some Germans, and comes face to face with his sergeant who's pointing a machine gun at him. Uh, fortunately, they realized who they were, 
Uh, there was a bit of a laugh and, and they went running off. They regrouped back near where they built the roadblock, which was quite, quite close to the top of these steps. Uh, but uh, Dernford Slater was had to sort of plead with his men not to go and blow things up because they'd found a couple of attractive things that they thought they could go and blow up, uh, one of them being um, a, a light at the end of, of Jerberg, um, which was on top of um, a, effectively a little signal station. Um, the only shot that was fired by the commandos was actually accidental. Dunford Slater, realising that they were running a bit late to go back to the boats, was running down these steps, tripped, and he had his Webley pistol was cocked at the time and unfortunately went off, which actually um, did bring the only fire from the Germans, which was a brief burst of machine gun fire um, from some Germans that they hadn't actually found. In reality, most of the Germans were back into the Peace Port because they didn't mm -hmm. stay at this stage of the war, didn't stay out on the cliffs. Um, they got back to the beach and they realized that the tide had, had changed. It wasn't possible for the boats to get in close enough to pick them up. So uh, they realized that they were going to have to strip off some of their kit, leave some of their kit behind, and they were going to have to swim to the boats. Uh, now, this presented a problem because Dernford Slater couldn't understand why there were a group of his men who seemed quite reluctant to do this. I talked about earlier, the um, it, was, it was quite hastily put together from a, a number of regiments, and uh, they didn't actually ask the question at the time, can you swim? Uh, which seems like an obvious question to ask now, but of, you know, in the haste of assembling this um, force, they hadn't asked it. So there... Dernford Slater said a few choice words, um, uh, sent his men, the, the men off um, to go and hide uh, and promised that the Royal Navy would come and pick them up either the next night or the night after that. Uh, unfortunately for them, uh, the Royal Navy decided that it was too risky uh, and they weren't willing to come back and get them. So they they went into hiding effectively, um, uh, but unfortunately were captured later. Uh, now, this obviously appears like a, a massively unsuccessful raid, but allude, going back to what you alluded to earlier about what Damien said in the past, it, they, were, they were just making this up as they went along. They hadn't, you know, there was no experience of doing this sort of thing. Um, so they learned some really good lessons from this, uh, which uh, Dernford Slater took on um, took on board. Uh, he went back to uh, England, and one of the first things he did was say, it's just not suitable using these boats. Um, so they actually um, started to use uh, most torpedo boats or most gunboats. Uh, and he uh, commandeered one uh, effectively for his own uh, use by his uh, commandos. And it, and it is amazing, Nick, the progression over four or five years. Even by 1942, certainly by 43, commando raids, airborne raids, they're, they're much more meticulously planned. You know, there wouldn't have been the mistakes of making sure people can't swim, those kind of, you know, can swim. That, that, the, the learning curve <clears throat> was steep, but the results were, were clearly there. And, and as we've discussed on this channel many times before, it's more about the statement. It's more about the fact that we have managed to land people on an occupied shore. Quite yeah. what we did when we got there. I'm thinking about the raid on the on the aqueduct in Italy, the parachute raid, things like that. We did with Neil Cherry last year or, or earlier this year. It, it's not about what they achieve. It's the fact you can do something at all. It's the fact that you can mount operations from the UK. You can get them to these places and you can do things under the nose of the Germans. And quite whether they achieve what they're supposed to, it really isn't the point at this point of the war, is it? No, absolutely. Absolutely. And... It, you know, it, it caused it caused a lot of problems for the Germans because it was uh, it, it made them really nervous because yeah. they weren't sure. Uh, they found obviously some of the kit that had been hidden, so they knew the commandos had been there, um, and they they found the roadblock obviously, and so knew that somebody had been up to something, uh, and it made them really nervous about what was going on, um, uh, and it led to them actually heavily mining the south coast of the island pretty much actually all the way from uh, St. Peterport on the on the um, east 
coast, all the way around the south coast, right around to the the far end of the island. Um, and, and that was pretty much immediate after this. Um, so one of the great things about the blog is I get people who get in touch with me. And uh, you probably won't be able to read this. Um, it's a little bit small, but this is uh, was given to me by a lady called Liz Walton, um, who lives uh, locally. Uh, and it was a relative of hers who'd actually helped um, hide these guys that couldn't swim. Uh, and she hid them for a, for a few days, but unfortunately they were caught walking down, literally walking down a road, uh, and, uh, and they were detained and became prisoners of war. Uh, but it's these sort of stories that I find really, really interesting. I touch on this a little bit more in the, in the, in the blog if people want to go and have a look at it. Uh, but they went on to be firm friends with this couple and they came back for um, golden wedding anniversaries. They act, some of them actually attended the funerals of both of these, uh, the, of this husband and wife. Uh, and, you know, they went on to be lifelong friends, effectively. How fantastic. Now, Ambrose Sherwell uh, got a little bit of a, uh, a, a kicking in quite a few publications and... Uh, uh, about how uh, he as uh, the bailiff, so effectively for those not aware of what a bailiff is here, it's not somebody with a transit van that comes around and bangs on your door if you don't pay your bills. Um, it's actually uh, the, effectively the head of the judiciary and um, also the, the leading uh, citizen in the island effectively. Uh, quite complicated to explain, uh, but that, that again, I've got a little bit on the blog about that, which maybe helps un, uh, understand what that did. Now, uh, Sherwell had a very difficult job to do because he was trying to um, walk that fine line between doing what the Germans wanted uh, and protecting islanders from the worst excesses of this. Now, bearing in mind uh, the Germans had threatened to bomb the island if there was any trouble, because, of course, they only had a small amount of their own forces here. They could easily move them around. They threatened to bomb St. Peaceport or bomb St. Helier, um, which they'd done previously, as Duncan talked about last night. Um, uh, and they, they were talking, you know, that they would do that if there was any trouble caused by the islanders or, in fact, anyone else. Um, so that was very much in the forefront of Sherwell's mind. Um, he was also very concerned because... Uh, some of the uh, raiders like uh, Mulholland or Martel and, and Nicole uh, were all Guernsey folk with families still in the island, some of whom were actually very high up in, in, the, uh, in the government system that had been put in, into place. Uh, and it was going to be proved to be very difficult for them uh, to claim they knew nothing about these people being here. So he wrote a letter to the British government, uh, effectively saying, please don't do this. It's going to you know, cause massive repercussions uh, for the islands. Uh, and he asked the Germans to ensure this was passed on through uh, diplomatic channels. For some reason, they declined to do that. Uh, so the letter never actually made it anywhere. But people do sort of hold that against him. But he was, you know, it was early days in the occupation. He was trying to work out how to get to grips with dealing with the Germans. And, of course, everyone, uh, you know, had read about what the been going on in, in mainland Europe. Um, so, you know, they didn't, you know, want anything uh, to, to happen. Um, so that was it. Or was it? Well... Churchill was absolutely furious that the Omni Shambles was ambassador. And he actually said, let them eat no more silly fiascos like those perpetrated at Guernsey. So you'd immediately think, well, there'll be no more of these raids then if Churchill said that. Uh, as I mentioned, sending Guernseymen back was a problem. It was also an advantage. You know, they knew the island. They knew how to move around. But it also, you know, brought repercussions potentially. So at that point, you're probably thinking, gosh, this talk's going to be over quick. Um, but just over a month later, Hubert Nicole comes back again, this time with Symes. 
they come back on the 3rd and 4th of September, so they leave the UK on the 3rd. Um, and initially, they were quite successful. They you know, managed to gather intelligence, uh, and it, it was all going well uh, until the Navy failed to pick them up. There was bad weather again, which is a feature of quite a few of these raids, uh, which caused problems uh, in them being picked up. So they effectively ended up on the run until the 21st of October. And we'll, we'll come to why the 21st of October in a minute or so. Now, um, there was uh, an attempt to uh, rescue Mulholland and Martel earlier. Um, a sergeant who was in, um, also a Guernseyman was sent back to look for them. Unfortunately, he was sent early August. They'd already um, had to surrender. Um, so... Uh, there was an attempt by Captain John Parker, who came back to uh, try and uh, make contact with Nicole and Symes in late September 1940, when, of course, they were still on the run. Uh, now, he climbed the cliffs, uh, but unfortunately for him, the Germans had already boosted uh, some of their positions up around uh, the, the cliffs. And he unfortunately slipped and fell into a trench and straight on top of a German. Um, so his visit was very short. He was taken off to be a prisoner of war. Um, and there were severe consequences when Nicole and uh, Simon surrendered. They'd spent a lot of time either hiding with family, hiding with friends, uh, they uh, were both ex-pupils of Elizabeth College, which was the school that I went to. Uh, and Stu Burbridge, who's also watching here, uh, will uh, also mention that there that uh, we both knew Hubert Nicol. We didn't know at the time what he'd done during the war when we were at that school in the 1980s. Um, as, as Stuart says in the, co in the comments on the sidebar there, um, uh, he used to start uh, our swimming races with a starting pistol. We had no idea that Mr. Nicol, as we knew him, um, uh, you know, had done all of this. Uh, so it, it is quite interesting. Um, there is a, a, a plaque which explains the raid, which is actually in the cricket pavilion that they spent some of the time hiding in. Um, uh, and that's, you know, if, if you ever find should find yourself at the college field and get the opportunity um, to ask them if you can see it. Now, I mentioned earlier, there was this worry about consequences for them and for their families and those that helped them because they, they had a fairly extensive number of people that helped them, not least the groundsmen from Elizabeth College. Uh, so Sherwell, again, trying to um, stop any uh, Consequences, because of course these men, although those photographs show them in uniform, uh, were not in uniform. So they could have been shot as spies. Uh, the Germans were really, really nervous that there were um, uh, forces personnel in the island. They'd actually captured a few um, when they invaded the island because people were back here on leave, because incredibly, people were still coming here on holiday in June 1940. Wow. Uh, which is a, a whole other story which I've, I've written about, but it's quite fascinating. Um, but they weren't convinced, even when they arrived, that they'd sort of mopped up all of the ones that were here. Uh, they also then thought, well, you know, if we found Kit on the beach, there's probably some of them kicking about. So they published um, uh, a, a proclamation after Sherwell spoke to Major Fritz Ban Bandelau. Apologies for my pronunciation if that's not correct and he said look um how about if we have uh some sort of immunity for anyone that hands themselves in uh, right. because they could have faced the death penalty or various other um penalties uh and uh he agreed to this and published a proclamation that effectively said anyone um uh that uh you know, handed themselves in, there would be no consequences for anyone that helped them. Uh, which all sounds well and good. And uh, they took some comfort from uh, this uh, proclamation that had been issued and the letter that Sherwell had to that effect. Unfortunately for them, they handed themselves in with five minutes to go on the 21st of October before the amnesty expired. 
and um, the major himself happened to be away on leave. They were quickly whisked off to France, uh, where they spent uh, two and a half months in solitary confinement. Uh, uh, 14 of their friends and family, including Sherwell, who'd helped them, um, uh, were also taken away. They were deported uh, and spent time in France as well. And they were all living under threat of uh, being shot or uh, various different sentences. Now, I've got another slide here, which again is may not be overly clear, uh, but it came to the 21st of December 1940, and uh, the major had been absolutely furious when he found out about this, that he, effectively his word had been broken. And uh, he, he moved heaven and earth to stop them from um, getting shot. Um, and he said to uh, Sherwell, he actually spoke to Sherwell and said, you know, my, my word is my word. And he was uh, absolutely beside himself uh, at what, what had happened whilst he wasn't there. So this comes to the proclamation here is from uh, the uh, Guernsey Press. I've got an extensive collection of papers from the, from the occupation, which seems to be ever growing. And uh, it was on uh, Christmas Eve, uh, 1940, and it lists all the various different people, uh, how the Germans thought they had broken the rules, and what the potential penalties were being death or in various lengths of imprisonment. Uh, and uh, the, the what you can't see in this is uh, they then decided that they were going to treat uh, the commandos as being commandos and not being spies. They also decided to send uh, everyone back that survived um, to uh, Guernsey Sherwell, however, was not allowed to retake his post. Uh, so again, you can see clearer images of that on the blog. Unfortunately, it doesn't show up very well here. Yeah, but it's just an excuse for people to go to the blog, isn't it? And <clears throat> before well, we move on, yeah, sure. ask a question. I'm, I'm, I apologize if it's a dumb one, but the, and it, it may be different from Guernsey and, and Jersey. But did did the Germans treat everybody on these islands the same way? Because I'm assuming some people there had maybe dual nationality. There, I expect there were some people from maybe France or Switzerland working in restaurants and things like that. I know there'd been the evacuation before sure. the Germans arrived, but once once the Germans are there, was everybody on those islands treated exactly the same or were there levels of status that would give you a different type of punishment if you in, in, incurred and, you know, if you did something wrong? I'm, I'm not sure if there was um, anything that would give you a different type of punishment if you did something wrong. I think that was probably fairly fairly standard, whatever your nationality was. Right. Um, uh, uh, Duncan spoke yesterday about Winifred Green, the lady uh, who said Heil Churchill when, when uh, a Swiss chef said Heil Hitler um, to her, uh, and uh, she got deported. Uh, Ironically, the Swiss chef uh, then got caught pilfering things and got a longer sentence than Winifred Green did. Uh, wow. he, got three, he got three and a half years. Okay. Um, so um, so the, from that point of view, I don't think there really was uh, any difference in treatment uh, so much. At different points during the war, though, uh, when, uh, for example, America entered the war, uh, any Americans were uh, deported. Uh, right. Uh, also, when the Russians switched sides, uh, there are proclamations that dealt with they they had to um, uh, go and register, and by doing that, they then ended up uh, um, having to um, get, you know be deported. Um, there, there there wasn't anyone that I'm aware of that was shot in Guernsey I can, uh, for any resistance activities. I can see Stuart's mentioned in the. Um, yeah, put it up on screen. There, that he thinks a couple of people were shot in Jersey for resistance activities. I think he's correct on that, actually, uh, and that one of them was in fact French. Um, so yeah, that that was the case. Um, so moving on from those early yep. days raids, then um, I, I probably should mention actually that that uh, both Symes and Nicole uh, got the military cross for the, what they'd done. Um, having spent so long hiding from the Germans, gathering information, etc., uh, And uh, Symes, interestingly, went on uh, to uh, win another military cross in 1955 uh, in uh, Malaya, 
uh, for dealing with terrorists in Malaya, um, which is just another uh, another little aspect of it. Both of them survived the war um, uh, and went on uh, to uh, have different careers. Um, Nicole came back and was an insurance salesman. Uh, Symes had a long, distinguished military career um, before he retired. Um, so talking about um, uh, the planned large-scale raids that I alluded to earlier and and a little bit of an obsession with them. So uh, Stuart will be pleased because a lot of this relates to Organy, and I know it's, he's very passionate about uh, a bit of the story about Organy getting out there. You it looks see... like he, I was talking to him today. It looks like he might be coming on at some point in the future and doing an Alderney Channel Lions World War Two TV special. So, so we've convinced another one of uh, one, another one of the what the viewers to become a to become a guest. So that's fantastic. Excellent. I'm sure that would be really good. Having spent quite a bit of time talking to Stuart at it, at it um, about it in the in the past and messaging, um, that will be uh, one to look forward to. That's for sure. You can see there. There's some. Germans, uh, that's actually a, um, from the Bundes archive. One of the great things about the Germans was they loved taking pictures, uh, of which there are hundreds in the Bundes archive. Um, you can spend a lot of time looking for pictures of the Channel Islands there. Uh, uh, lots of it about their fortifications, as I'm sure Jersey War Tools will, will attest to. I can see they're, they're here tonight as well. Uh, and that's looking out over Bray Harbor in Albany. Um, so these planned large scale raids. Uh, they, they kept resurfacing. So the first one was Operation Attaboy, um, which was uh, a plan uh, to raid Alderney, as was Blazing. Constellation was a plan to try and retake one or all of the islands in March 43, uh, uh, which became Concertina, which goes back to Alderney. But we'll, we'll see why that is um, now. Um, so why were they contemplating this? What was, what was the reason for it? And it's quite interesting, if you go back and look, um, uh, as I do, spend my evenings looking for things to try and link some of these things that you read about in books or people's diaries or, or that you've already found in the archives and you try and tie things back, stuff that you just find by accident, to be fair. Uh, when you're looking for something completely different, you stumble across a reference to something. And uh, the Chiefs of Staff uh, minutes are absolutely fascinating, the War Cabinet Minutes, um, you find all sorts in there. Um, now, one, one, of, one of the great sources that sort of took me to those was uh, General Sir Alan Brook. You can see him there uh, in that picture. Um, and he got mighty miffed about some of these plans. Mountbatten, Churchill and Hughes Howard became slightly fixated with taking one or more of the islands back, which... If they'd gone ahead, they really would have been disastrous, frankly. Um, uh, you know, certainly for Guernsey, Jersey, uh, there would have been massive loss of life, uh, particularly so in Jersey because there was a larger civilian population there. Um, uh, but they kept coming back to these plans, very, very similar plans, frankly, over a number of years, um, as, as we'll have seen. Um, and they always end, seem to end up coming back to maybe they wanted to try and take Albany because very limited uh, population in Albany, uh, varying from sort of four or five at one point uh, civilians, then you know, a few working parties of people sent over, made to go over and, and work uh, in Albany. So uh, there, there's various numbers that people put on it, but it's civilian wise, you're probably, you know, looking at no more 20, 25 at right. any one point. Um, and Albany, of course, is quite close to um, the Sherberg Peninsula, uh, and the Germans started putting large guns on there. Uh, ironically, probably the one that would have had the most chance of actually um, succeeding was the first one, Operation Atterbury, because at that time, there weren't actually that many uh, fortifications there that would have made a lot of difference. Uh, it started out, again, as initially a plan to retake one or more of the islands. Um, uh, eventually, they settled on Alderney. Um, there is some talk that, um, you know, they were, they were trying to so show some progress in the war. Um, who knows? Um, they, they, there were also other reasons, perhaps, why Alderney was looked at. The Germans used it to 
uh, control their shipping um, that was going up and down the French coast, uh, if it was going past there. Um, and they concluded that, you know, well, they had no idea of the garrison size at the time, so it was a, a massive punt. Uh, it was concluded that if you read the minutes, they go on quite extensively about this over a period of time, uh, that it was probably feasible, but it was going to be high maintenance. Uh, you're looking at an island that's three miles by one and a half miles, um, and, you know, it's going to take a lot of men to retake that island. Um, the island that you can see at the top uh, left there is Buru, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but just while we've got that map up there, it'll uh, help give it just, a little bit. Just a bit quick of question for you. In, sure. in your, well, maybe a long question, actually, so I apologise, but in the yeah. recipe search you've done, when names like Hughes Hallett come up and Matt Matten come up, I can't help thinking of David O'Keefe and his work on the pinch raid aspect, because yeah. I'm assuming that the Channel Islands have Enigma machines on them <clears throat> that the Germans are using. And we know that 41, 42, 42 particularly <clears throat> is the era the Allies are very worried about the four rotor Enigma machine going to service because they're going to they're gonna lose their ability to break code. So I'm wondering whether in any of the files you've, you've, you've read the name of you know, Ian Fleming's name has ever come up or anybody else there, because that may have been a reason. I'm just throwing it out there. I'll sure. bring David O'Keefe in at some point to respond to it, whether or not there was any possibility of these raids being pinch raids to get Enigma, because that makes sense, you know, not to take the island, but to hide hide a raid to get an Enigma machine as yeah. a destructive raid on something else, because that was some certainly something that that is David has, has been working on. Any 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 thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite interesting because if we move away from Attaboy now, we move on to Blazing. Um, now, you, you can see in the photograph there, that's actually one I took of a photo that's on a, on a wall um, in a museum here. Those, those circles there are actually the ranges of different uh, gun batteries in the islands, uh, which you can see do cross over to the Cherbourg Peninsula. Um, at various points, and they've, they've got, you know, the waters around the Channel Islands fairly well covered. Um, and this, this one actually got as far as training uh, for the attack in the Isle of Wight, and they're going to use Guards Regiment to do it. Um, there's actually a really good um, uh, audio archive in the, in the Imperial War Museum uh, with one of the chaps that was involved in this. Um, I, I've written a, a, a blog about it, unsurprisingly. Um, <laughs> Uh, using some of the stuff that, that's come out of that, which is really interesting, tying that into other things. And one of the things that comes out of it was uh, they ask him at the end of this interview, well, you know, what did you do after this? Then you were stood down from this raid. What did you do? And it turns out they were part, part of this was then used as planning towards Dieppe. Uh, some of the troops were also used um, for the Dieppe raid as well. So there could possibly be some sort of, um, you know, uh, interaction with with that. Um, well, as we all know, if we say Enigma enough times and we we circle, then it summons David O'Keefe from Canada, and he'll appear absolutely. in the sidebar. So, if if we all join together and link hands, folks, and say Ultra Ultra Enigma Enigma, we will summon David O'Keefe from the depths, and he there will is. come here and and and, and appear and and and, and give, give us his knowledge. But yeah, that that there is the fact that these people moved on to the Dieppe raid is is really interesting. Yeah, um, and there is an Enigma machine in, in one of the museums here um, that you can go and see. In fact, I was there uh, just the other day at the weekend. Um, so th this one was a bit more uh, ambitious, shall we say. The initial plan was to hold it permanently, uh, which was going to be a massive amount of resources. They decided they'd need 4,800 men to land, um, and they were going to have a massive naval bombardment uh, as well as a bombing raid on it. Um, and they really were thinking about it because if they held that, it might actually cause a few problems for the Germans on the French mainland. But logistically, it was going to be an absolute nightmare. So they thought, you know what, let's just hold it for a week, which seems just crazy to put this amount of resources into it. Um, and I, I'd said earlier that Brooke got a, a little bit annoyed with Mountbatten on quite a few occasions. Uh, and he, he records in his diary on the 6th of May 42, arrived just in time to go to chief of staff meeting to turn down proposed attack on Alderney it's, uh, as a large raid by, uh, by the Guards Brigade. He also then goes on to say, 
a truly bad idea. Um, now, this was partly colored by the fact that the RAF said, basically, if you want fighter cover, we can only give you fighter cover for 15 minutes at a time overall, didn't they? Um, and we're going to tie up a huge amount of aircraft. They predicted that they might actually lose up to 700 aircraft if they were holding it for a week, which would just have been crazy in 42. Mm. Um, uh, and, of course, the Germans could take off from airfields on the Sherba Peninsula and on the other Channel Islands and, and hang around for absolutely ages. So it just was a completely, in my opinion, bonkers plan. Yeah, um, I agree. Bonkers. Yeah. Um, but... That there was also the element that perhaps uh, they uh, they were under pressure to start a second front. Uh, Stalin was pushing for it, and they thought this might be some sort of small sock towards Stalin if they had taken Albany and held it, but they were really serious about, you know, starting an attack on, on mainland Europe. Uh, so that's blazing. Uh, again, I've written about that one in much more detail. Because we were limited on time, we're kind of... Yeah going through these a little bit quickly. Um, uh, then they came up, we're a year on again. It always seems to be March that they seem to come up with the idea they might want to attack the Channel Islands and, and you know, perhaps take one of them back. Um, Lord knows why. Um, Mount Batten, of course, has got the ear of Churchill, um, being a member of the royal family and also uh, spending a lot of time staying with Churchill uh, weekends at his private residence and things like that. And they used to sit around... Uh, drinking you know in the evening and they come up with these plans we all know that Churchill liked a good boy's own adventure and Mount Batten would be constantly in his ear over a weekend there's there's quite a lot of that recorded in various accounts where uh, that's partly why Sir Alan Brooke got quite annoyed with him because he kept he kept having to diffuse these ideas that that Mount Batten was coming up with and then Hughes Hallett would sit there in a chief of staff meeting as well and go oh that's a good idea um, and then Churchill would get roped in, and 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 it, it used to take a. They'd spend a lot of time on this. Um, as I said, it could have been devastating for the c civilian population if they picked another island, particularly when we get to the amount of forces that they were planning on using on this. Um, it was just absolutely crazy. Uh, so they uh, decided. I know. What about Alderney? We've planned for that before. Let's have a bash at that. So. That operation, again, you probably can't read um, read these, um, but I have got bigger copies on, on, on the blog. Um, uh, Concertina was the renamed operation. We're back in Albany again. Um, they were happy that there was a minimal civilian population. They estimated slave workers were about 500. That's massively out, you know, the, but that's just what they recorded because they had no real intelligence um, about what was going on in Orkney. There was only one escape from Orkney, and that was much later in the war. Um, uh, and they were going to devote, again, a massive amount of resources to this. Uh, more worryingly, uh, they were going to uh, have four to 500 light uh, to medium bombers uh, and 16 squadrons of B-17s. And they're going to use them for two days. Now, if you can imagine, we've already just talked about Orkney being quite a small place. The destruction that that would have caused on the island would have, you know, well, I'd question whether they'd successfully hit it very often. I'm sure with that amount of force, they would eventually manage to hit it quite a bit, but it was going to take an awful lot of bombs. Um, you know, um, it's, it was just beyond beyond belief. And again, all for what? It was, you know, really not going to work. The other idea they had back actually with Blazing, which is talked about by the officer that I uh, I mentioned, uh, again, which is a problem that he identified, was somebody suggested that they'd uh, use paratroops to land on Albany. Now, as he quite rightly said, it's it's about a mile and a half by three. Um, you, you're going to have 20 seconds to drop paratroops before somebody gets their feet wet. <laughs> um, so that was, again, an idea that was discounted. Um, so... That was that one. They finally gave up on on um, Albany uh, then, but we'll come back to these guys now, and there will be some more talk about Albany in a mo. Um, so the small scale raiding force came about, which you mentioned is uh, an absolutely excellent book um, on the subject. The people that you can see there at the top left is Major 
Anders Frederick Emil Victor Shout Lassen VC MC in two bars. Um, something he, of a legend. Uh, something of a legend. He was Danish, as you might gather from the name. Uh, there are some interesting accounts from uh, the captain of the MTB that they used uh, as, as to his thoughts on him uh, being ruthless, quiet, uh, and he I think he was actually quite scared of him. Uh, the chap in the top right is uh, John Appleyard, uh, who got the DSO, MC, and Bar. And below that is uh, Gus uh, March Phillips, who DSO, MBE. Sadly, none of these gentlemen survived the war. Uh, Lassen was killed in uh, 8th of April, 1945. Um, uh, Jeffrey Appleyard, I can't remember exactly when he was killed. Uh, and Gus Marshall, Italy, wasn't, it? wasn't it in Husky? Yeah, it was. It was Husky, actually. Yes, you're yeah. right. Uh, and uh, Gus March Phillips was killed during Operation Acquaint. Yeah, uh, Ecotun, he's he's buried about 15 miles away from me. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. very frequently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sadly, he he was killed during that operation. Now these guys uh, form a bit of a theme when we go on from here. So when I said earlier, well, there were quite a few. Um, this is the list of raids that actually happened. Uh, we'll go through them at a reasonable pace. Um, so we're almost at Aldney. We're at the Caskets Lighthouse. Uh, Operation Dryad, which was carried out by 12 men of the small-scale raiding force. Now, as you can see from the picture, that is not a particularly hospitable place to try and attack, not least because of the rocks, the fast-moving current, and then you've got some Germans to contend with. Now, fortunately for them, the only Germans that were there were effectively signalmen who were there to control the light when they turned it on for German shipping uh, and also to operate a radio. Uh, a, a funny little story that, um, uh, that they tell is that uh, actually there was a little bit of confusion because they found all of these guys asleep uh, and two of them were wearing hairnets, so they initially mistook them for women, uh, which caused a bit of confusion at the start. Uh, but they destroyed the lights, the radios, uh, dumped all the weapons that were there in the sea and successfully got off again, although um, Apple Yard injured his uh, <clears throat> ankle during the course of that one. Um, so that one was really quite successful. And Apple Yard was a little bit indiscreet in his letters back to his father. And he talked about the uh, seven little, I think he called them, uh, seven little angels that were singing, uh, which is obviously alluding to the seven prisoners, because he talked about we've been back because they actually tried to land on the caskets uh, shortly before, but the weather had defeated them. Uh, and he, he talks in his letter about we we went back there to where, the area where I was recently. So he'd obviously told his father at some point when he'd been on leave or something, where you know where he'd been. But they proved to be a great source of. Um, Information, unsurprisingly, it became very unpopular amongst the Germans to go and be stationed on the Caskets Lighthouse after that. Um, so it, that was really not something you wanted to volunteer for. And uh, that, that, you know, it, it formed part of the making Germans worried that, you know, you might be sit on the coastline somewhere guarding it and you'll get snatched. Well, that's the whole point, isn't it? And that's what's come yeah. up in other shows with Neil Cherry and Damien, is, is to instill in the Germans, wherever they are within occupied Europe, whether it's Italy, Yugoslavia, the, you know, the, the Mediterranean or, or the Channel Islands, you might be attacked by some commando jumping at you out the middle of the night with a, with a commando blade. That, that's, that's kind yeah. of the fear you're trying to instill in people, isn't it? So that you just theoretically you're not going to do your job as well you're just you're on edge all the time so again yeah. this is, we've talked about it with other people it's how you measure these rate these raids how you measure the success is open to interpretation is it because because fear amongst the uh the, the troops is very difficult to gauge and to understand over the next few weeks and months it might have had a drip effect uh, on these so so yeah it's uh I, I think that's sort of worth mentioning that that just because you don't necessarily kill a garrison of German defenders doesn't mean you're not having a huge effect on the morale of the garrison. But yeah, absolutely, and it made the Germans very nervous throughout the Channel Islands and and you know mainland mainland France as well. Uh, so the next one, we're almost at Aldney. We're I mentioned uh, Beru, the island um, 
uh, which is uh, about a mile and a half off the coast. Oh, near, and Op Bramford was where they actually went the small scale rain force again, uh, just after Dryad. They uh, went to have a look because for future plans, maybe you know, maybe we might want to use Buru as an artillery base to attack Albany. Um, and they landed, it was just to assess the suitability of it. They landed and got away, and basically nobody actually knew they were there. Buru is the island just at the top right of the picture there. Uh, that's Albany itself there with the, as you can see, the, the long um, uh, pier at the, at the harbour there, the long breakwater. Um, so then we get to Basalt, which, as I said, I'm not really going to talk about because Eric, an uh, absolutely fantastic guy for this, and uh, he'll be filling you in on, on this uh, next Monday. Uh, but that's the famous raid on Sark. That's a, a picture of Sark there. Um, oh, this slide's not quite worked. Uh, it's Huckabuck, uh, which you can see the lovely island of Herm, which is just off Guernsey's coast. Uh, and uh, the beach that you can see sort of running down the left-hand side of the picture is Shell Beach, uh, where, there, again, small-scale raining, uh, raining force were here. Uh, they had a look around the island, uh, found no Germans, because effectively the Germans were using it more for... Um, a bit of R and R during the day. They'd go shooting there, um, you, you know, shoot uh, rabbits, etc. Um, and then they'd retreat back to Guernsey. Uh, there were um, uh, some people there, the LePage family, who were caretakers. Uh, and again, another of the uh, great things about doing things like this is a gentleman called Jeff LePage got in, in touch with me when he saw I was going to be talking about these raids, and said, "Oh, uh, my uh, my grandfather was actually." Um, uh, on there as uh, the uh, caretaker and they, his grandmother was convinced that there had actually been somebody there overnight um, and uh, particularly because um, she uh, came out and saw that um, you know some of the, the doors were open on a barn and things like that um, and uh, an almighty row broke out between them because they were arguing about whose fault it was and that these have been left open and uh, actually um, it, it turns out it was the commandos. They did leave some leaflets for the Germans to find for exactly the reasons that we were talking about just before. Um, but that's that was just quite a nice little story that uh, that I got told um, the day before yeah. yesterday. Uh, Pussyfoot, again, sorry, the slide's gone a bit funny yeah, here. Yeah. PowerPoint does that sometimes with StreamYard, doesn't matter. There are will yeah. Um, anyway, this was another planned raid shortly after April 43. Uh, again, they were going to do it, got mid-channel. They just didn't didn't work out for them. While, while I'm on this one, uh, this uh, MTB 344 was one that they used throughout their raids, actually, the small-scale raiding force, uh, nicknamed the Little Pisser. I'm not really quite sure why that that is the, the case. I've not looked into that. Um, According to the guy in Normandy who wrote the book about Operation Aquatint, is because it 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 leaked that the, the in the in, in the engine room something it leaked, so they kind of used to piss all over the place. So they called it Little Pisser. So there was something in to do with the transmission or the gearbox or the engine that leaked. So uh, that, that's what that's where I understand the nickname came from. That would make sense because there is reference to the, that happening and them having to repair it mid-channel on. Well, there we road. are then. We've 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 sorted something out between us, Nick. The coming <laughs> together of minds. Wonderful. So there we go. So anyway, Pussyfoot didn't happen. Um, to be honest, probably really not um, worth talking about more than that. Uh, Hardtack 7. Uh, now, this wasn't a small-scale raiding force. Uh, this was a raid on Sark. Uh, there is a memorial there, which I took a photo of a, you know, a couple of years ago when I was in Sark, um, which is near the site where they, they came up. They took the same route as Basalt, which proved, frankly, to be disastrous. Because of course the Germans had mined the area and moved a lot of the people from Sark into the centre of the island, or even some of them to Guernsey. Uh, so a couple, couple of people got injured in minefields, and it, it frankly was a little bit of a disaster. That um, if you, can, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there, there were a couple of guys killed on the raid. Yeah. Uh, their, their names are annotated there. Uh, but it was an international force. There were French and British in, in, in that um, in that raid. Um, uh, that's just a photograph I took from up near the memorial where you can see the kind of cliffs they had to climb up. It was uh, not something that I would uh, particularly want to do, uh, certainly not in the dark with 1940s kid. 
uh, with somebody potentially about to start shooting at you or dropping roll mines down the down the cliff. Mm. Um, it's unusual because Hardtack 7 actually got a bit of coverage in, in the newspapers in the UK, mostly because the Germans made a big fuss about it. Basalt also did. The other raids, they, they didn't really make a fuss about. Um, so there's just a, a, a couple of bits there from the Manchester Evening News of 29th, December 43. Um, Hardtack 28. You're probably wondering why I've not mentioned Jersey yet. Um, it was, in fact, the only raid on Jersey. And it was partly felt that this was probably because um, and, you know, some people say it was Jersey was you know just that bit closer to to France, um, so maybe they they wouldn't bother. Now Jersey War Tours have got an absolutely fantastic article on their website, um, which I would really commend people to go and read. Uh, and it's got a video as well, where they've got some great photos which show all of the locations that talked about. Um, and again, the aim was to gather intelligent and intelligence and prisoners uh, and ironically this is although it's the only raid on jersey it was probably one of the more successful uh raids uh they unfortunately if you look at the top of the picture there you can probably just make out there's an area called egypt um which is in jersey and they landed up there which was actually a training area phil touched on the fact that that you know the coast they they really went for the, the coast that was facing in the wrong direction to have all their yeah. troops uh, uh, so where they landed was a training area, so they found it was actually deserted of Germans. They encountered three locals. Uh, the first lady shouted out of a window at them in German because she thought they were Germans trying to trick her, so they left her alone. Uh, eventually found the Le Breton brothers, one of whom was in so much shock at their blackened faces, etc., that um, uh, they he couldn't speak. Uh, eventually, the other brother... Uh, sort of sat them down when they became happy that they could trust them. They were actually British and not Germans trying to trick them. And they gave them gave them some milk um, and had a chat with them. The These brothers were actually farmers, so knew the area really well. Uh, because they were farmers, they also knew where all the minefields were, or at least they thought they did. Um, unfortunately, uh, there was one minefield that they didn't know about. And on the way back, uh, Captain Aiton... Uh, was tragically injured, uh, which turned out to be uh, fatally, uh, as he died later on um, in the day or, or the next day. I can't, can't remember, recall. Um, but it was deemed to be successful because they came back with a lot of intelligence about what was going on and, you know, barbed wire and bits and pieces like that so they could uh, analyse that. So that that was the only raid on, on Jersey. Uh so uh, just you... before you move on to the Loma Raids, I want to address one of the things I love about this 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 channel is the is the viewers contributing questions and comments and theories. And Rob Crane is saying that he's increasingly thinking that the hardtack raids were cover raid for COPP reconnaissance raids. So that's the uh, um, combined operations pilotage parties um, in Normandy. Uh, been sent a docu document that refers to twelve reconnaissance cover raids. Have you heard anything about that, Nick? Yeah, I've 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 heard of that being suggested. I've not actually seen anything that that indicates that. Um, but then again, I've not actually looked for for anything that, that kind of links the two. It would make sense because the small scale raiding force were, you know, raiding all over the the French coast anyway. Um, so you know, it could, it could well have been um, something connected. And then connected. this is where that you know, just again, I'll go back to you in a minute. Is that None of us who study World War II can possibly have, be, live long enough to do everything. And where collaborating with other people is so important because, you know, you're working on what happened in the channel lines. Rob Crane is obviously looking at something else. David O'Keefe's doing his pinch raid work is that by coming together, sometimes research will overlap and what you've been working on will help with someone else's research and vice versa. And Phil from the Jersey War Tours, what he's working on as well, and, and Duncan Yesty. So, it would be interesting if that we could get a little posse of people who are researching on things that then has an overlap that means that yeah. we can push some of this channel lines research on because it there's clear clearly there's there's potential more more um information to find out about these these raids yeah absolutely um and one of the great things about living in a small community is i uh you know that there are several other people that are, are you know tour guides or people that have uh, just do this as a hobby that you know uh, regularly ring me up because they'll have found something and they wonder if it crosses over with anything that I've looked at, 
or you know i know i can ring them up and say look have you, i've just found this can i ping it to you on an email yeah. can you have a look and see you know if this rings any bells with you um and i really do value that you know that, that people will you know share their research um quite quite freely which is great um yeah, no, definitely. And it all helps you know it all helps um everyone so uh why no more raids uh well as you can see from this uh, newspaper cutting which uh, explains what it was like after the channel lines were effectively cut off after the D-Day. Um, they were they were effectively um, a prisoner of war camp that didn't need guarding. Um, yeah, uh, and strategically of no use. Which interestingly, you know, that had been concluded way back in 1940 when the islands were demilitarized, and yet they still mounted, you know, they had these plans to to retake one of the islands. Um, there was Operation Witticism, which was cancelled due to weather. That was actually our friend Larson, Larson again. He was going to come and, uh, along with three other guys. They were going to take canoes into St. Pitbull Harbour and mine the shipping that was there. But the weather was just against them. There was fog and, and really rough seas. So that got canned um, in uh, early January 43. Uh, were there any others? Uh, interesting going back to sharing information now i've been talking to a couple of uh people that they've, they've got things that indicate there might have been something else you know on a very small scale but it's just not been either discovered in the archives yet or a lot of stuff there is still a lot of stuff that's time barred that you can't yeah. access I mean, I'm all, I'm all, and i'm also wondering nick you know given given where i am in normally in my interest in the airborne landings is that given that the american air armada for d-day bringing in the paratroopers flies over the channel islands and as phil said on monday the number of anti-aircraft batteries there are on jersey and i guess there's others yeah. on the other islands or whether there would never been any consideration of some raids on june 4th 5th or something to kind of knock out some of those anti-aircraft I mean, anti batteries as we know <clears throat> As far as I know, no no aircraft was ever shot down by those anti-aircraft. I don't even know how many shells they fired that evening because the, the weather was bad. But whether yeah. that was ever a consideration, because you know it, the the Allies with 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 June the sixth are trying to maximise their chances of success and 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 maybe sending in something to knock out some potential uh, 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 batteries that could have hampered that fleet was was considered. Or have you, have you ever found anything like that? Yeah. Um, well. The... The, the Germans, surprisingly, were very slow on D-Day to actually uh, do anything in terms of anti-aircraft fire. Um, there, there's a, a diary by the Reverend Lord, um, and he records in that that you know these planes were actually keeping the islanders awake as they're going over, and he didn't hear any gunfire till 3 o'clock in the morning. So some hours after they'd started here, um, I think they started hearing planes at about uh, ten or eleven. I can't remember, recall off the top of my head. That would that would be about right because the first the first drops were sort of mid, mid just after midnight here. So yeah, so it, yeah, yeah, 10, 13, and, uh, 11 o'clock. Yeah. yeah, and they could hear gunfire, you know, from the, the naval bombardment uh, throughout the you know campaign. So um, yeah, so that's that. I mean, they there were um, air raids to try and knock out the radar at Fort George here. Um, uh, which uh, the Canadian pilot sadly was killed, a Typhoon pilot. He actually came on uh, two separate occasions to attack it. The first time he damaged it, the sec uh, second time he came back, unfortunately, he was shot down. Um, uh, so the in, the in the end, they concluded after Heart Attack 28, the, you know, Laycock canned all these raids because they were just using up too many resources mm. um, and encouraging the Germans to reinforce the um, things where they could so let's let's just stop doing that okay uh, I thought I'd switch things around a little bit now but now we've talked about the allied ones I'll just touch on this briefly because I know you we were talking earlier and you, you're planning on doing something on this at uh, some point later on uh, a chap that if people were watching last night Huffmeyer who was a commandant uh, former captain of the Scharnhorst uh, a very ardent Nazi uh, decided in March 45 that it'd be a good idea to raid Granville. Uh, it was successful from the German point of view. They got 30 US POWs um, uh, who stayed in Jersey for the rest of the war. They mined some ships, damaged some docks. They liber liberated some German POWs. Interestingly, some didn't fancy it so much. So at the first opportunity, did a runner and surrendered again um, before they could be taken back to Jersey because they knew what conditions were like in Jersey and didn't fancy it much. Um, 
there were a number of Allied casualties, uh, sadly, both uh, British and American uh, and uh, French uh, dock worker as well. Uh, but as I say, I won't I won't touch on that one too much. Um, because uh, we talked about it, and you're planning on doing something. Like well, that. I mean, and I can extend the invitation to you right now because if if and when I cover it, it will be in March. Uh, so we could do it next March, or we could wait till March 2025, 25th on the on the on the anniversary. But whatever, yeah. I mean, there is yeah. Folks will be watching. There is a Heimdall book on the operation, uh, the German operation. It's quite extensive because the Germans there were quite a lot of photos taken of it, and so it's quite an interesting interesting yeah. read. And I believe it was the last sort of amphibious raid of in the ETO of World War II. And it was the Germans against the Allies, which was interesting. But I think it was the last one. Yeah, I, I believe it was. Yeah, and I'd, I'd happily come back and talk about this. I've got an awful lot of stuff on this. Um, so, yeah. Happy, happy well, that to... sounds like we've made a, we've made a second date. The, if, if this oh. is kind of a, if this is like a blind date, Nick. We've, we've, <laughs> we've gone through the first one. We're already making plans for the second one. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, mate, more than happy to do that for you. There's, a, there's quite a lot to talk about that. We've probably doing, yeah, as I say, an entire show just talking about that and uh, about what a horrible person Hoofmeyer was and what his yeah, motivation was. Yeah. Um, they made quite a fuss about it. So in the Guns Evening Press, you, again, you won't be able to read this here, but I've, I've blogged about it um, where you can see a, a proper size image that you can read. And they, they made a big song and dance about this raid and, and how wonderful it had been and, and you know, what they'd, what they'd done. Um, yeah. Obviously, a limited audience for that newspaper. Um, yeah, we've roughly we've I've cantered through some of them because we had an idea on timing wise. Um, but I thought uh, those of the independent company that are here would be uh, disappointed if I didn't include some concrete in the presentation somewhere. So there's a couple of bunkers for you that uh, I photographed around the island recently. There was um, some conversations there about when you're going to mention the concrete and Katie jumped in and said he's not going to and, and Jane said I hope he does and Mary said I hope he does so yeah, there, there, there was there was obviously a concrete fix and I, I and, and I don't need much in, in temptation to start talking about concrete so it's like yeah. it's, it's a, there, there's some great restored um, facilities to go and look at here um, some absolutely fantastic work by Festin Guernsey there are several really really good tour guides who we you know, take you to see a lot of these um, things that um, <laughs> I can see Jane's getting very excited by the concrete. There. Yeah, Jane, uh, Lydia, Jane and Mary are getting all excited about concrete. Now. I don't know what that, I don't, it says more about them than it does us, I think. Yeah, you know, I if think we're so. Being, I being think honest. But yeah, I mean, oh, and Stuart as well, concrete. Yeah, so it's not, yeah. it's not just the girls, it's the, it's the, it, the yeah, boys it's, as well. <laughs> it's kind of a running joke with the IC, which... Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's concrete is 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 something that is, is not talked about enough, I think. But yeah, well, I mean, I it's been a brilliant presentation and you know as you said there it's not it's more than just that one raid that we're going to be talking about on monday there's the the fact that it was considered and and i think the fact that that you're plowing away doing this research is 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 to your credit because it there's clearly more stuff to be found out there's more connections to be made there's overlaps with other areas i'm intrigued i did try and summon david o'keefe on facebook but he's probably teaching at the moment because I'm, <laughs> I, I bet there's some kind of pinch raid enigma overlap because david will always will find that he, he's found them in um the 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 san nazaire raid he's found some pinch raid information uh connections there and with the uh the the, the bordeaux uh com, you know, commando sbs raid so you know, I I would be really surprised if in forty two the channel lines hadn't come up in some kind of shape uh, concept of of, of, yeah. of acquiring Enigma because the Allies were desperate and that, that so we could bring David on to talk about that. So um, yeah. So yeah. anything else you wanted to say about about this or, or? really just um just as a follow up there that's just got the the blog address there although you've got it in yeah. the details. Uh, I've got a Twitter account for this as well. I'm more than happy for people to drop me a line with questions. Um. Because quite often somebody asks me a question and I'll, I'll say, oh, actually, that's quite interesting. I, I've not thought about that. Um, and I'll go off and look at it. I've also done research for a couple of families where um, they had um, people who were brought here. In one case, um, a, a Dutch chap that was brought here and forced to work here. They didn't really know how to go about finding out about what had happened to him while he was here. Um, uh, the lovely people at the archives here, I, I can't thank them enough, the, the, enough because the, they, they indulge my every if every request, be it something random like, can I see the shipping logs for 1943? Do you have them? 
um, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, just randomly asking about things. But have you got anything on this person? So I, I was able to go and find stuff for them, which gave them a lot more information. I didn't write a blog about it because I'd said to them, look, if you want me to write a blog about it, I can. But if it's too personal for you and you don't want me to do that, then I won't. I've also done that for another family who lost a family member here mm. um, and they were unable to find much information about it. But there are still two family members alive who remember this chap dying. Uh, and I researched it for them and found a lot of information and said, look, I'm not going to write about this because you've still got family around that are alive that actually remember this event happening, albeit they were small children at the time. And I wouldn't do that, but I was more than happy to research it for them. So, yeah, please get in touch. And, and more importantly, uh, come visit the Channel Islands. Um, well, yeah, I mean, definitely. That's been something that's been discussed in the sidebar. And and, and I, I was trying to get there in October. I don't think that's going to happen now. I, I'm going to try and plan a, a longer trip for some time when, when I can. But it's, as I said yesterday and the day before, and I, I said we reinforced the idea today, that there's so many aspects of World War II that can be covered by visiting the, the, the islands. It's the, 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 the German side, the concrete, the Atlantic War, the positions, and there's the commando raids, there's the civilian experience, the occupation, there's the engineering aspects, then there's the, the various crashed pilots and things like that, and graves and aircraft, aviation stories, uh, the stories of agents, resistance. I mean, it, there's an awful lot there. In, yeah. in, a, in a comparatively small area. And I'm glad we'd be able to bring some attention to it because, you know, I thought about it, uh, at one point I'll be able to do a show or two. And then obviously I've got enough for a week here and we've clearly got enough to go into do another week at another point And we could do a week just on Jersey or a week just on Guernsey yeah, and, and Alderney. We haven't even touched Alderney and Stuart, we said, is going to come and talk about that at some point. So, well, thank you very much, Nick, for, for, for joining us. And um, it's been really great. And folks, I do urge you to go and check out the, the blog because you'll find the same information you presented tonight, but in more detail with bigger photos and, and, and stuff to download there and, and links to other places. So it's a, it's a, it's a great resource. And the same applies to Phil's Jersey war tours website. And of course, uh, there'll be the work of, of, of Jilly next week and Eric as well, also doing work on channel. And so, well, it's been brilliant. You've, you've broken your world war two TV duck. So this is, the, I'll open it at the invitation to other IC members. And if you're wondering, watching this, not, not sure what the, the, the in joke is, just to remind you, the independent company is the name for the people who are patrons to the James Holland and Al Murray. We have ways of making you talk podcast, which I've been on and Nick's involved with, and you're part of that. So there's an overlap of World War II TV and the bigger and better and more successful uh, we have ways. But I kind of think I'm kind of pulling, using their wake to pull me forward. So it's been great talking about that. So, um, well, Nick, thank you very much. It's been brilliant. So, um, our Good. next two Channel Line shows are on Monday. So Jilly is joining me in the afternoon and Eric in the evening. And then hopefully we will have the rescheduled Arnhem show on Friday evening. But the presenter, Krista, he's got a bit of a cold and a cough. So we're not sure it's going to happen. I'll keep you updated. But definitely nothing tomorrow night. I'm going to go to the pub with Colin tomorrow night. So I'm going to, my, a rare weekday evening in the pub for me. So there we are. So fantastic job. So Nick, it's been a pleasure talking to you again. We will hoist another one. Definitely we have ways next July if I don't see you before. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, thanks, everybody. This is Paul Willard from World War II TV, so I'll see you all again next time. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Bye.